God is planning on having a lot of children. The only way that you can become a child of God is through the miracle of the new birth. Jesus said, don't be surprised, don't marvel at this. You must be born again. You do not become a child of God by joining the church and singing on the worship team or teaching a Sunday school class. You become a child of God through the miracle of regeneration. So God is planning on a lot of children and he's building a big house where his children can dwell in spiritual fellowship. It's called the church. It's a big house. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And once you are born as a child of God and you're in his church, you discover that you are an ordained priest. The purpose of your life is to turn everything in a sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And as you live on planet earth, even as a child of God and a priest that serves the true and living God, you realize that you're living in a hostile world that hates the very God that you represent. But God has planned you to live in a world that is hostile toward his gospel so that you can model the heart, the humble and gentle heart of the elder son in his family. And the elder son in his family is Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Peter says to us that he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin might live to righteousness. So we live to righteousness because of Jesus Christ. He's the elder son who is Lord of all over all God's house. And we live in a hostile world. But we're okay with living in a hostile world because we know that we are living in the time of the end. God's clock is ticking quickly to the final hour when he will bring human history to a screeching halt. And we're trusting him. Even though our lives are a strange mixture of glory. You track it with me, church family? Our lives are a strange mixture of glory and grace. You say, glory? Yes. That first chapter, Peter said that you have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, kept in heaven for you. But Peter says, don't be surprised when your life is struck with fiery trials. So the life of the believer is a strange mixture of glory and grief, but we endure it because we know we're in the time of the end. And God has a great purpose for why we suffer in this world. We talked about that last week. Do you remember? The first thing he said is the reason you suffer is for the purifying of your faith. God sees all the impurities deep down in your soul and he turns up the fire so that the dross floats to the top and he removes it from your life. So suffering serves a great sanctifying purpose in our lives. But it's not just for the purifying of our faith, it's for the proving of our faith. God doesn't test us so that we will fail. He tries us to show us that our faith is valuable and it will withstand any pressure that the world can throw at it. Not only do trials purify our faith and prove our faith, but they give us perseverance. By faith we persevere in the purpose and will of God. Now today we're coming to a whole new chapter and a new paragraph in Peter's storyline, and it is simply this. God looking down upon his church, seeing them suffer in the world, says, I need to send them under shepherds who will represent the chief shepherd, Jesus, until I appear and take them home. That's all in 1 Peter chapter 5. God sees his suffering church and says, I'm going to give them under shepherds or leaders who will watch over them as my representatives just as I would watch over them until I appear one day in glory. Will you come with me please? Let's think about that this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'm going to read just the first four verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. As always, I need to remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it. This is God's word. As Martin Luther used to say, when we open our Bibles, God opens his mouth. 
Listen to the word of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you. He's not talking there about the older saints. He's talking about the people, the men, who hold the official office of elder. He says, and I exhort you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the un fading crown of glory. Do you remember that David prayed in Psalm 28, O oh, save your people and bless your heritage, be their shepherd and carry them. The theme of shepherding is a common theme throughout the scriptures. David prayed for Israel, be their shepherd and carry them. We all remember, don't we, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So the theme of shepherding is a common theme in the scriptures. So much so that God said through the prophet Isaiah, tell my people that I will give them shepherds after my own heart. And then remember as Jesus began his ministry, the Bible says he saw the peoples of the earth hurting and, and in need, and he responded with great compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus appears on the scene, and he sees hurting people, and his heart is moved with compassion because they were like sheep wandering through the difficulties of life without anybody to guide them. Maybe that's why he told that famous story in Luke chapter 15. And he told the story of one sheep wandered away from the fold. Just one. The great shepherd left the fold to go and find the one shepherd. Excuse me, the one sheep. He found that sheep and he put it on his shoulders and he carried it back to safety. Telling us, of course, that he is the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. He is the one who came as the great shepherd of the souls of men to redeem us and to save us. So with that theme of shepherding in mind, is it any wonder that Peter says the character, the makeup, and the work of those spiritual men in the church that are supposed to guide her in the will of God is like the heart of Jesus and the shepherds of the Old Testament. Peter's saying... When God sees his church in need, you track it with me, church family? When God sees his people suffering, he knows full well that what they need is leadership. But not just leadership. Leadership who will love them and care for them as Jesus himself would do. I think it's developed in this text. Let me show you, first of all, in verse number one, that shepherds protect the flock. In this verse one, he highlights the character of the elders. Clearly, I'm preaching to a select group in our church this morning. But in essence, I'm preaching to everyone because you of all people should be able to say, these are the kind of leaders that we have the right to expect. This is who we need to be the elders of our church. So I am preaching just to the elders, but in essence, I'm telling everybody, this is what a healthy church will look like. You have a right to believe that the shepherds, the elders, the under shepherds of the flock have your best in mind and their purpose is to protect you. Have you learned while reading your Bible, linger slowly over every word? Because if you take off way too fast in verse number one, you'll miss the whole point. It's just a two letter word. It appears to be completely insignificant. But Peter says, so, therefore, because of, because of what? Because my people are hurting. I need brave men who will stand at their side and defend them and encourage them and help them. Men called under shepherds, men called elders. The last thing church needs are weak men, spineless men, 
who are afraid to stand up for the church and do what is right. I told someone the other day, being a pastor and elder and overseeing the local church isn't a popularity contest, it's a faithfulness contest. We've been called to obey Christ and to guide his church and to lead his church and to help his church, and it's going to take brave men. So Peter says, in light of the fact that God's people are hurting, what do I need to give them? Men with some, oh, forgive the word, it's a crass word. Men with some guts who aren't afraid to face whatever enemy is threatening the church. There's the coolest story in Acts chapter 14 where we have the details of Paul being stoned for preaching the gospel. They, they dragged him outside of the city and left him for dead. And the disciples... We're not told if this is a miracle or not. We don't know he's actually dead. The disciples gathered around him and Paul got back up. Now you would think in the character of the average man, Paul would have said, I'm out of here. Let's move on. Paul said, no, we need to go back into the city and strengthen the souls of the disciples that have come to Christ. And then he said, who's with me? He appointed elders. He said, who's with me? establishing the true nature of what it means to be an elder. It's a man who doesn't run from trouble, but runs to trouble when God's people need support and encouragement and direction. You tracking with me? The church is being deserted today, right, left, and center. Cowardly men aren't prepared to stand up to the austere task of standing by the church in its greatest hour of need, as the church in Canada is right now. They're off doing their own thing, appointing themselves as elders, rather than hearing the call of God to stand faithful with the flock. Pity the poor church that is abandoned by cowardly men who won't stand up for them when they're in need. Now, lest we get too high and mighty, let's not miss who wrote this letter. The church needs brave men, but it needs men who are forgiven men to lead in the church. The office of elder is not reserved for men who have never sinned, who have not fallen into sin. Listen to me. We're talking about Peter here, for goodness sakes. We're talking about the man who, in the presence of a wee little girl, cursed the name of God and denied that he knew Jesus. And the man to whom Jesus found him, After his resurrection, I need to meet Peter. I need to have a reassuring conversation with Peter. Peter was a forgiven man. And don't you ever forget that every time Peter had to exercise the need for leadership, he remembered that he was a forgiven man in need of grace himself. There's no such great leader in the church as a man who knows full well. He's there by divine appointment, not because he deserves it, but because of the amazing grace of God. It is felt to me in some churches that the office of elder is elite. It's only for a few specially trained, particularly squeaky clean kind of men who really are rich and famous and influential. Fact of the matter is, when you've been forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ, you may be the best candidate to stand by his church because you know when you failed him, he stood by you and he redeemed you. So don't forget, Peter says, protect the flock. While you're protecting the flock, you remember that you also have been a failure. But they need to be reliable men, don't they? Peter says, I'm talking to you as a fellow elder, as one who has been a witness to the sufferings of Christ, a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker of the glory that is to come. Hey, I meant to say it to you. I want to go back because it was a lesson to my heart this past week. Do you remember Peter was one of only three that was so highly privileged to travel up the mountain called the Mount of Transfiguration. And before his very eyes, the glory of God Almighty descended in Jesus Christ, transformed into his majestic glory, and there stood Jesus in all of his brilliant glory and Elijah. So don't you trust some high religious spiritual experience to keep you from ever faltering in sin. 
That's not the point of God giving you great experiences. God gives you great experiences so that you will walk in the valley below day by day dependent upon him. We're just like the Israelites, aren't we? We want God to give us a great instantaneous miraculous deliverance through the Red Sea. When they can't trust God every day for what they need in the wilderness. God wants us to walk every day in faithfulness to him, not living for the miraculous deliverance through the Red Sea. So back to my point of departure. They're reliable men. They're called witnesses and partakers. Isn't every Christian a witness? That's what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Peter is saying uh, elders need to be reliable men who are witnesses for Christ and partakers in his glory. We're going to come back to that in just a few moments. Are you still tracking me, church family? How many have I lost? Put your hand up if I've lost you. Oh, no, I didn't catch anybody. I don't want to go too quickly because notice what Peter is saying in the text. I exhort you. That, that implies that they were humble men because only humble men are willing to be exhorted. When you need a word of correction, a word of spiritual qualification, and the godly elder comes along and says, hey men, you're missing the point. A humble group of people will say, I'm so glad in your wisdom you saw what we need at this particular point in our lives. So he says, we're going to be humble enough to accept, we're going to be humble enough to accept when somebody needs to correct us in our lives. Now this word exhort is an important word. It's a word that every elder must adopt into his spiritual heart. It's the word that was used by Jesus to describe the Holy Spirit when he would come. The paraclete. The one who would come alongside to comfort you and teach you and strengthen you. So the elders are like that, aren't they? They come alongside God's people to exhort them, to encourage them, to guide them to greater spiritual maturity. It's a hard day to be a faithful elder for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is we live in a period of history where everybody thinks nobody, everybody thinks nobody has a right to correct them. But if that's the case, Jesus can't be your Lord because of the Lord. And, and furthermore, we're not prepared to speak the truth into each other's lives. We're as dishonest as the day is long. We tell people everything's fine and we really know we should have admonished them. We should have exhorted them. We should have told them the truth. It's a tragedy that the church has fallen prey to the politics that keep us trapped in an inability to tell people the truth. So these men are protecting the flock. They're brave, forgiven, reliable, humble men. Of course, the text says they are the leaders in the local church. I'm forever grateful that this church recently adopted the biblical model of elders governing. Listen to me carefully. There are two offices in the local church. But isn't it significant that Peter does not address the deacons here? I've said it before and I'll say it again. You will not find one shred of evidence in the New Testament to demonstrate that deacons are the overseers of a local church. This text is one of the texts among about six of them that make it very clear that the spiritual leaders of the local church are the elders. They were practiced early on in the life of the church and it has been the, the habit of the church. So the elders are to protect the flock. Let me move on to number Two, verses 2 and 3, shepherds tend the flock. Let's talk about the duties of the elders. Notice what he says to the elders. I want you to shepherd the flock taking oversight. I think he's referring there to the maturity that is required in an elder. It's interesting that the word for elder here is used throughout the New Testament to speak of an older person. The implication that can be drawn is that you cannot adopt a man who is too young to be an elder because in the care of souls, he's not seasoned enough, he's not wise enough to hear all the evidence that he needs to hear. An elder is someone who has learned through his own journey, through helping others to grow spiritually, that there are three sides to every story. There's his story and her story and then God's story. 
And an elder is the one who is determined to find out the truth, God's truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. What is he saying? You've got to be mature enough to watch over the entire congregation. With an eye for everybody. And afraid of no one. Prepared to speak into whatever situation. Do you know how many churches have fallen apart because elders simply refused to deal with a matter that was smacking them between the eyes? An elder does not have that right. An elder to be an elder must take the oversight. It means to watch from above. Making sure that everybody that needs to be cared for or corrected or guided or loved will be cared for. Keep in mind, Paul said, the purpose of the elders is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry until we all come to the maturity of Christ. So it's the development of the gifts of God's people and it's the development of the Christian character of God's people. So if shepherds tend the flock, it means that they must be mature leaders. Men who, by virtue of their spiritual maturity, gain your trust because they, you know that they are not gullible, nor are they partial. They're not going to take what you say at face value because they know that every one of us are prone to see life just from our own perspective. And they need to be wise and seasoned men in whom you can place spiritual confidence. One of the primary reasons that the church in Canada has declined in recent years is because we have not taken the time to develop disciples, let alone developing elders, according to the teaching of the New Testament. They need to be mature men who have walked with Christ. They need to be caring men, according to the, this text. Notice what he says. He says, you're looking after the flock of God. I love that word. You're like a bunch of sheep all of whom have been gathered into the heart of God, and you are his very own flock. So how did he care for his flock? You remember that text, don't you? In Isaiah chapter 40, watch this. He, that is Jehovah, will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. So when God sees his people in need of shepherding, his response is a response of compassion. God doesn't look down upon my stupidity and get ticked off at me. He sees me in my defeated state as a sinner. And his heart is moved with grace. His heart is moved with compassion. And he says, anybody that takes up the responsibility to shepherd my people must have a caring heart. Do you know, church family, that your elders love you? Do you know that they, should, that, that they need to carry you on their hearts just as Jesus carries the flock of God upon their hearts? Wouldn't it be tragic to have a competent group of men leading as elders, but they really don't give a rip how you're doing in everyday life? It's the flock of God! and he loves his people, then the elders need to be careful to make sure that they also are motivated by a deep, deep love for the flock of God. I love the way that David wrote it in the Psalms. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our maker, for he is our God, and we are his people, the sheep of his hand. And so the elders are responsible for taking care of the flock of God. Let me just touch on this briefly. Notice this not but clause in the text. You say come again. It's a not but clause. N-O-T-B-U-T. He gives three things that the elders should not be and three things that they need to be. The first is they don't serve out of compulsion. That means that they have, they're serving out of guilt. They've been coerced into taking responsibility for the flock. But deep down inside they don't really want it. They don't want the weight. They don't want the burden. An elder is one who says, I'm not doing this out of compulsion. I've not been strong-armed. I'm not doing it because I have a sense of guilt. I'm doing it because I care. I'm doing it willingly. Then he says, not by shameful gain. That word means, most Bible teachers agree, it's using the office for, for gain for your own purpose. 
is the idea, or for deceitfully using God's people's money for your own advantage. Of course, the Bible says that the workman is worthy of his hire. You should not muzzle the ox. So the Bible teaches that elders can be paid, pastors can be paid a respectable salary. That's not what he's talking about in the text. He's saying that an elder with a heart for the sheep would never misuse them or the money they give to God's people. This past week, a gentleman came to the front door. I don't normally take these calls. Pastor Max does because we want to make sure that there's consistency in all of the situations. The gentleman was asking for a donation. He asked me if I had any money in my pocket. I said, I've got 50 cents. It's not going to help you much. But I want to just talk to you. Before I gave him any gift from this church, I wanted a promise from him that he would take the New Testament and he would read it carefully because in it he would be introduced to the Son of God and the Savior of the world who could change his life forever and ever and ever. But furthermore, I said, I want your name and address and phone number because the money in this church is not mine. It is not the elders and it is not yours. It is God's money donated sacrificially by the Lord's people. And we want to make sure that everything we do with these monies honor the one to whom they were given. And we are committed to the highest standards of practicing financial integrity. It's the elders' responsibility, not the deacons. The deacons help, but it's the elders' responsibility to make sure that we are fiscally doing everything we're supposed to do with the money that you have faithfully and sacrificially given to God's work. What does he say? These need to be tested leaders. They're not doing it by compulsion or for shameful gain, nor are they domineering over the flock. What does it mean to be domineering? Well, you have to be careful that you don't interpret this word by a man's personality. Some men who are pastors and elders are very outgoing. Some of them are loud when they preach. Um, some of them are quieter or softer. He's not talking about that. Domineering means that you're using the people to get your own way. And if they don't go your way, you threaten them and you intimidate them and you coerce them to get what you want done. Uh, this very text, doesn't it, argues for the need for strong leadership in the church. He says take the oversight. You're going to have to have some backbone to do that. But don't overstep by thinking yourself a superior to those that you are serving. You are their brother. You are their fellow elder. You still with me, church family? You can feel the humidity rising, can't you? It's going to break at mid-afternoon, and you're, going to be, you're just going to have a wonderful afternoon. Elders are the under-shepherds of the flock. They have a heart to protect the flock. They have a heart to, to tend the flock, do whatever needs to care for the flock. And thirdly and lastly, elders encourage the flock. And they encourage the flock continually by reminding them that Jesus Christ is going to appear again. And that you should live your life now in light of then. And everything you decide now should be decided in light of the fact that he said he's coming again. This is one of Peter's favorite themes. Do you see it throughout his letter? Jesus is coming back again. Are you ready? What you're suffering now means nothing for the glory that's going to awaken when he finally comes. So we encourage the church. The, the elders, the under shepherds are going to be faithful until the chief shepherd. One of my favorite titles for Jesus in all of the Bible is this one. The chief shepherd of the flock. He revealed himself as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and now the chief shepherd. The chief shepherd is going to come. And he's called the chief shepherd because, listen to me, he has a particular eye on all those men who have served the church down through its thousands of years of history, and he's going to personally reward them. It's a very intimate text. He says, I am the chief shepherd. You are an under-shepherd with direct responsibility to me. You can't be an elder unless... You... Listen, church family, I love you, but I'm not in your employ. And the day that I am is the day I leave town. I'm not your employee. I have one... Shepherd-in-chief, 
His name is Jesus. He's my chief shepherd. He's your chief shepherd. And he is shepherd in chief of the nations of the earth. And the planet is going where it's going because he is moving it where he has predestined it to go. So he says, tell the church, hang tough, people. Don't quit now. The pressure's mounting. I feel so small when I preach this way because I'm preaching in Canada. You get my point? I'm preaching in this safe, cozy, comfortable country where we have everything we could ever imagine. There's no real threat because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But all across the globe this morning, there are pastors who will have a bullet put through their brains because they know Jesus and they are going to awake in the presence of the chief shepherd and he's going to say, here is the unfading crown of glory I've given to you. You are faithful to me. I reward you with this unfading crown of glory. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to wrap it up, but I want to remind you not to forget the emphasis of the New Testament on the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Here's how John wrote it in John chapter 1. He said, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. So a faithful elder is one who continually encourages the church to live in light of the soon appearing of Jesus Christ. And how is that going to happen? Well, if I'm alive when he comes, if I die before he returns, they're going to lay my body in a grave. And I would choose, for me, traditional burial. They're going to lay my body in a grave in a few short months. My flesh will return to the dust of the earth from which it was created. And that body will lie there. But my spirit has gone instantly to the presence of God Almighty at the side of Jesus Christ. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. But if I'm still alive when he comes, I'm going to hear a trumpet sound. And the Bible says the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised first. All those bodies will come back from the grave. They will meet their spirits in the air. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible teaches a glorious rapture when all the saints of God will hear a trumpet and will be caught up to meet Jesus. Meet, are you with me? Meet Jesus in the air. I'm going to behold him like Peter did on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't know how you're going to bow in midair, but I'm going to bow in midair. And worship him in all of his majesty and all of his glory. Peter says, elders, pastors, under shepherds, keep sounding the trumpet of God's word and tell the people there's a lot more than this. The day's coming when you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Are you listening to me, church family? You personally will stand, I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things I have done in my body, whether they are good or evil, the Bible says. And in that moment, I will look upon the one seated at the right hand of God Almighty. His name is Jesus Christ. And Revelation 1 says his eyes are like a flame of fire. You know what that means? You can't fool him. Those burning eyes of fire will pierce through to the true nature of how you have loved and served him. And you will be weighed in the fire of the discerning glance and look of Jesus Christ. Sweetheart, listen to me. You're not fooling anybody. Sir, you're not pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. Because one day, I don't know how it's all going to work. He's going to say, it's your turn. We need to talk. Here's what I would like for you, church family. I would like for you to have an unfading crown of glory. You know what that is? It's not an actual crown, I don't think. I think it is in the words of Jesus in Matthew 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. You enter into the joy of your Lord. I would just love it. Oh, I'd love it. 
if when I'm watching from a distance, I see him call Felisa. And he says, sister, well done. And it will echo through the universe. The stars will shine a little brighter at that moment. He calls you by name and says, Greg, good job, man. Good job. That is the unfading crown of glory for him to say, well done. Take it, child of God. It's yours. Live the life of obedience to him. And then hear him say those wonderful words. Lord Jesus Christ, our great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep and died as a shepherd lamb to take away the sins of the world. I pray that those people in this room this morning that have never encountered your saving grace, they've never truly been miraculously and supernaturally transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, will meet you today in a, sal in a moment of salvation. And for all the rest of us who say we know you, would you open our eyes to that day that will beat all days, that will end all days, that day when we give an account before you. We long to hear you say, well done. And I pray that your people will be motivated to follow you and that you will raise up godly elders in this church who will feel the weight of this body just like Jesus does, who will be strong and brave and caring and competent men who help the church in its greatest hour of need. Oh God, lay that burden of your people on our hearts so that we love them as the very flock of God. I pray in Jesus' name.